In this episode of Mind Pump, we talk about fitness assessments and why they are essential for everyone. Okay, an assessment is what's going to give you your map to get to your goal. So you know where to go, where not to go, what exercises to apply, and which ones to avoid. Without a good assessment, uh, you not only will not progress nearly as fast as you could, but your risk of injury goes through the roof. So in this episode, we talk about assessments. We talk about our favorite three movement assessments that address the entire body. We talk about exercises that you can do to fix your movement patterns if you can't do these assessments. By the way, because we talk a lot about specific exercises and movements in this episode, we are making sure to attach uh, links to videos for most of these movements and exercises in our show notes, which you can get at mindpumppodcast.com. So when you go to mindpumppodcast.com, it lists all of our episodes and it lists show notes so you can watch video. So if you hear us talking about, for example, in the episode, we talk about it, what's called a windmill test and we explain it and you're thinking, I don't, you know, I really need to see what that looks like. Go to the mindpumppodcast.com website, look at the show notes. There'll be a link where you'll see one of us explaining it on video on how to do it. Um, now, if you're a trainer, um, you definitely should pay attention to this episode. If you're not doing an assessment for your clients, uh, you're doing them a huge disservice. In fact, if you're going virtual right now, like most trainers are because of this lockdown, you definitely should get your hands on the programs MAPS Prime and Prime Pro to really help your clients out. And of course, anybody listening right now, those two programs can really help you not only self-assess yourself, but correct muscle imbalances and really set your body in the right motion for better results. Here's the best part. Both MAPS Prime and Prime Pro right now are 50% off. These are two of our most valuable programs for everybody. We think everybody should go through these two programs regardless of your goals, regardless of your fitness level, regardless of which MAPS program you're following or whatever other workout you're following. Everyone should go through these two correctional exercise programs. And if you're a trainer, you for sure should own these programs because then you can help your clients with them. Again, both programs, 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. That's M-A-P-S fitnessproducts.com and use the code PRIME50. That's P-R-I-M-E-5-0, no space for the discount. I actually think this is a, a really cool topic because we discussed this off air a long time ago when we first created all the programs. And I remember uh, Sal had already had MAPS Anabolic and, and then Performance came and then Aesthetic. And when we did that, one of the things that, that we all agreed on is that in a perfect world, uh, if we were to create them in the order that we think they're most appropriate, uh, Maps Prime would have came before all of those, mm -hmm. and and the reason why that is is when when you think about the the very first time you meet a client or a potential client, uh, the very first thing I do is not you know take them through a Maps Anabolic workout or a Maps Performance Aesthetic type of workout. Um, I do a full assessment on them. You mm -hmm. have to. You, yeah. You have, it's it would be like taking your car to the mechanic. And you never tell him what's wrong with yeah. the car, and he never does. They just start like taking parts away. Yeah. yeah, you just drive it up and be like, "All right, I'll be back tomorrow." You know, figure it out. It's impossible. Um, and one of the most valuable things that a trainer can provide uh, a client, a potential client, is uh, a good assessment. Is the ability to assess the individual, the person, not just through movement, but also through questionnaire to help figure out what the best approach is because the 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 medicine has to be right for the person. So if, if you're if you're going in and you have specific goals and time frames and you know how your body moves and hurts and all that stuff, if we consider all of that, we can create or or direct you towards a program or a way you should work out that will give you phenomenal results. If we don't do that, we're shooting in the dark, and at absolute best, you'll get some progress. At worst, you'll hurt yourself or cause yourself to regress. Not only that, like, and I love the I, I love that you use the uh, the car analogy of bringing it to the mechanic because how many times do you guys remember this where, you know, a client comes in and either one, 
uh, has no idea really what their goals are, what they want to do, mm -hmm. or two, have, have no clue of what they, they should be addressing first before they ever even consider trying to lose 30 pounds or building 15 pounds of muscle. So I remember the first part of my job with a client was convincing them of what they, they need to do first. And the analogy of the car mechanic, it's like someone coming in, like someone like me who knows nothing about his car at all, and trying to tell the mechanic what to do. Like, mm -hmm. how often did you get that? Like, how often did you get a client being like, this is what I want you to do. I don't want to do this. I want to do that. And you're like, and we're in a service-based business. So you're kind of caught in this dichotomy of, okay, what the client wants and what I know is best for them. Like, how do I... Yeah, well, I just think of it like this. Like, they come in and they want their car just faster. They want a bigger engine. They want to get, you know, super fast and powerful. And, you know, the mechanic sitting there will, like, assessing the car and seeing, you know, potential hazards, potential things that, you know, are, are immediately stand out that uh, need repair or need to be reinforced in order to then uh, even drop in a new engine and to, you know, soup it up more so that it's even safe on the road. Well, let's, let's go back to what you said about goals. Cause I think a lot of people listening are like, I know what my goals are. Um, you would be surprised uh, at that you might not have a, a specified goal because the vast majority of the people that I'll ask, what is your goal when they would come to hire me as a trainer? The vast majority would say what? Lose weight. Yeah, no, or get in better shape. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, I just want to get in better Vague. shape. You know, oh, I just want to lose weight. Well, how much? Uh, I don't know. You know, 20, 15, 20. Mm -hmm. You need to have a specific goal and really understand the direction you want to go. What does better shape mean to you? Um, okay, I want to lose how much weight? I want to be how much stronger? How do I want to feel when I move? This is very, very important because if you don't have a specific goal and you just think, I just want to you know, improve my, my shape, uh, how you apply your workout is going to be less specific. It's going to be less effective. Well, not only that, and to Justin's point, I love the, that you – made the point of, you know, fixing or reinforcing, right? A lot of people come in and they just want more horsepower. Like I think of that as like, oh, I just want to build more muscle, right? Or I want to lose a certain amount of body fat or weight, but your body's not reinforced to handle what you want to do to it quite yet. And a lot of times that's the case. A lot of times, especially since a majority of clientele that I think most of us trained would be, you know, north of 35 years old, normally deconditioned and looking to get into better shape. And, you know, part of that process is making sure that we reinforce their joints and make sure their their body is moving and operating properly before I slap a 400 horsepower engine on it, right? Before I decide, let's rev this thing up and see how fast it'll go and see how much weight we can lose or how much muscle we can build. I need to first make sure that it's working properly and running properly and reinforced properly to handle what you want to do. It's just the order of operation. That's yeah. all it is. I mean, you, if you want a really nice paint job on your car, there's got to be a you know base coat or whatever you know primer that they put on it first. Otherwise, it won't look good. If you want to you know lose weight or build muscle, um, get stronger. Um, you may be thinking, well, I don't want to do all that correctional exercise stuff. I just want to get to the yeah. muscle building and fat burning. Let's just get there. Yeah. But you won't. See, that's the, that's the thing. Yeah. You won't get there because you didn't correct these issues, because you didn't establish good movement patterns. So it's not taking time away from you getting to your goal. It's not like you're going to get to your goal slower because you're focused on the, the, the proper order of operation. You'll actually get there faster. If you, if you ignore those things, not only will you get to your goal slower, you may never get to your goal or you may hurt yourself. So it's not it's something that we're saying that, oh, you know, yeah, you could do it this way, but this is a better yeah. way to do it. What we're saying is this is the way to do it. Right. And that's why an assessment. You know, or you'll why get it's so there and it's very short lived, which is I think is probably the most yes. common. Uh, what I see with a lot of these fitness plans and diet plans out there, they're really just trying to cater to. Uh, people coming in like exactly what they want. And, and you know, a lot of trainers fall into this uh, sort of mentality of like, I want to, I'm in the service business, so I want to produce something as quick as possible for these people because this is what they expect. Mm. And to, to be a better trainer, to evolve as a trainer is to then, you know, account for that, but now show them the proper way to do it. Well, this is also one of my biggest knocks on the group training because most 
group training classes don't offer some sort of an assessment. No, they can't. They can't. It, yeah, they it can't. It doesn't work. It's a, it's a class full of 30 people that are all different body types, all different goals, all different age, all different uh, fitness levels, all getting thrown into one class and, you know, running on a treadmill, rowing, and then doing some lifting weights. And, you know, there's a, a small percentage of those people that are that was perfect for them at their their point in their fitness career and it worked out for them there's a much greater percentage of people like Justin is saying that get temporary results that because yeah they're expending a bunch of calories and their goal may have been to lose weight that they end up losing weight but you know one of the number one reasons why someone cancels like an F45 and Orange Theory or CrossFit classes right is injury yeah. mm -hmm. And whether that is a major injury, like when I say injury too, a lot of times people think, you know, oh, I've never heard of someone breaking an ankle or or breaking a hip, and in one of these classes, it's not normally like it's normally chronic pain. Yeah, stuff just starts to bother you. Oh, I can't, I got to, you know, yeah. I can't do that anymore. My because shoulder my knees hurts are, when I do this. Yeah, now my shoulder's been bothering. Yeah, me. shin splints, shoulder issues, frozen yeah. shoulder going on. You got hip problems, bursitis. Mm -hmm. Like you start to see a lot of this, and what that is, that's an example of somebody who's tried to build all this horsepower, you know, push this push this vehicle without reinforcing all the other things to support that. And that's one of the biggest problems I have with the group training because they don't do that. Now that's just and that that's me picking on group training. You see this too in in the virtual world of coaching and training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of coaches that will, you know, here's your workout and it's like, okay, wait a second, you know, is that person ready for that workout yet? Or is that the most ideal workout for them? Or could we do something that's less and still achieve just as much results or do something even better? Yep. A, a fitness assessment is your map. And you're trying to get to a, a specific destination. Having a good uh, map is going to get you there faster. You're going to know which routes to take, the which routes not to take. And, and a map is very individualized. It's, yeah. it's for you. That's what the assessment does. So... Some of the questions you want to ask yourself, well, the first one we talked about was what your goal is. What is your specific goal? By the way, the more specific you are with this, the better. Okay, so mm -hmm. try to keep it specific and not super general. So what does it mean to you to get in shape? Okay, you want to lose weight. How much weight are we looking to you know lose? Okay, you want to build some muscle. How much muscle do you want to gain? So get very specific there. And even more, right? So sometimes... You, when people say a generic goal to me, like, oh, I want to lose 20 pounds, Adam, a lot of times I'll look back at them and I, and I see the scale and I'm like, you know, they don't even realize that I could keep their weight exactly the same and completely alter the way their body looks. Yep. So understanding that is even key. Right. So I want to look leaner. Right. I want to be leaner. I right. want to have a is it really about the scale or is it you want to look a certain way that you don't look right, right now and you want to achieve that? Because understanding that's important. Right. Mm -hmm. Understanding that maybe you're 140 pounds right now and you're a 5'5 five five female and you're like, man, I, you know, I, I think I look way better when I was 115 when I was in high school or whatever. Well- you know, that was your high school weight when you were a kid still, I could take your 140 and you can have an incredible physique. Mm -hmm. And that that seems crazy to you right now because you think, oh my God, I feel so sloppy or I don't like the way I look. But that's because you have a high body fat percentage. A majority of your weight is right now is, is more body fat than it is lean tissue. And if we actually build a lot of lean mass on you while we also lose body fat, you may stay about the same on the scale. Right, but well, yeah. you'll look way different. Right. You're yeah, and what people different. don't realize is like it, specificity is key when it comes to training your body. The more specific you can be about those types of uh, adaptations or things that skills or, uh, you know, losing very specific amount of weight or, you know, body fat percentage or, you know, whatever it is, the more specific you can hone in on that, the, the quicker you're going to get there. Uh, the more general you get, uh, the more your general training is going to look, it's going to take a lot longer for you to produce right. a, a result. Right. So another good question would be, um, you know, what is your current uh, level of fitness? This is a very important part to be honest here with yourself. How fit am I right now? Now, if you're not doing anything, uh, then you have a very low fitness level. Now, why is this important? It's important because, again, you want to apply the right amount of exercise. So if I'm going from no activity at all or barely any activity at all, then I don't want to jump into a you know four or five-day-a-week workout program. Um, it's just inappropriate. It's not going to produce better results. If anything, it'll produce worse results. So you want to be very, very honest with your current fitness level because 
in order to get your body to change, you just got to do a little bit more than that. And that step ladder approach is what will keep your body continuously progressing. It also helps you avoid plateaus. And plateaus are one of the number one reasons why people stop working out. Besides injury, people stop when they get their initial you know, burst of results and then nothing else happens. Yeah. Now I'm busting my butt working out. Oh, it's out. insanely frustrating. Super frustrating. But now I've got nothing to show for it. And I've been doing it. The first two months were great. You know, the last six months, I've stayed the same. Like I can't work out more than I've been doing. So if you want to avoid that, you want to you want to apply the appropriate level of intensity and exercise, and that's based on your current honest fitness level. And I think what goes with fitness level really well too is also your current commitment level to how much you can train right now. That's a, mm -hmm. you got to be real honest with yourself. Yeah, with that and one. and normally I tell people whatever you honestly believe you should commit to, you should start with a little less than that even at the beginning to again to your point so we don't hit a plateau last thing you want to do is someone say like okay i can commit to four days a week of training i mean if i get the sitter on this day and i do this like i could i could make this happen it'll be tough but i can make this happen like i don't want to start that person at yeah. four days a week i'm going two or three right you don't want to stretch too far out you want to do something that you you literally can do right now you want to and add to that so when you say to yourself how many days a week can i commit to exercise add the following to that sentence forever. Okay. So how many days a week can I commit to exercise forever? That changes it quite a bit. I used to love doing that. Like I would ask somebody, how many days a week do you think you commit to exercise? Oh, you know, and they're walking in motivated, you know, they're just signed up at the gym or whatever. Oh, I can do four days a week. No, no, no. How much do you think you could do for the rest of your life? Oh, what do you mean? Well, something realistic that you know, you can always do no matter what. The number always changes. Oh, I don't know, yeah. two days a week. <laughs> well, guess what we're going to design your routine around? Two days a week. Right. I want to design a routine around what you think you can be consistent with for the rest of your life because a consistent program done two days a week for years and years and years is going to be far more effective than an inconsistent program that you do five days a week because you were super motivated at one point and then afterwards life hits you in the face. And to that point, it's also important to uh, understand any sort of aches or pains or other things that you have going on because when you build a routine – that's around a generic goal like I just want to build muscle. There's you know the the order of exercise and uh, okay these are the best compound lifts to build muscle. So let's. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as someone throws in a new variable like oh I have bursitis in my hips or I have frozen shoulder or I have low back pain, even though they still have the same goal as the person who said I want to build muscle, their programming now changes. Mm -hmm. They, that same person, those, those two same people, we both want to build 15 pounds of muscle, but this person was more specific with their goals. It, well, I also have low back pain, and I want to take care of it that. It just got a lot more complicated. It did. And not only did it get more complicated, it also changed how I'm going to prescribe exercises. Yeah. Because I can still build that person muscle, but along the way, I'm also going to address why they have chronic pain in their low back. Now, it's important when you talk about what areas of your body hurt and, and that you, because sometimes people don't count the areas that hurt, that have hurt for years. Right, right. I would get this all the time. Because they're used to <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and so this is how you want to do it. So this is how I'd have to, I learned this through years. I'd have to change the way I'd ask questions. So in the, my early days of personal training, I would say, do you have any areas of pain in your body? And they'd say, no. I'd be like, cool. And I'd go to the next question. But then as I train them, they'd be like, oh, no, no, I can't. That, that hurts my shoulder. I got a bad shoulder. And I remember thinking like, why didn't you tell me yeah. when I first asked you? So I started to change it. So this is what I would say. I'd say, okay, do you have any areas of pain? They'd say, no. I'd say, does your neck ever bother you? Does your shoulders ever bother you? What about when you reach behind your back? Does that ever bother? Okay, do your right. elbows? And I would go joint by joint by joint. With examples. You, you literally do have to provide those examples because it's, it is. It's not one of those things that you immediately think about unless you're doing the movement currently. Yeah. So someone would say, like, no, my, my low back doesn't hurt me. And then you'd say, well, what if you sit a long time on a plane? Oh, yeah. My back gets really stiff. But, you know, that's just when I sit down for a long time. <laughs> right, right. Like, okay, but that's important to know. Right. right. That is an area of pain. So that's how you want to identify the, the areas of hurt on your body. It's not just the obvious ones. It's also the chronic ones where, yeah, my knees hurt when I sit down for too long or, you know, my shoulder does hurt if I'm, you know, washing dishes for a little, like, those are all things you want to pay attention well, to because that will dictate your workout. That's the real value in the personal trainer, mm -hmm. right? Right. The real value is, is in that. Anybody can Google and look up good exercises for strength building or fat loss. The real value in, in, the, in the personal trainer 
is is the their ability to assess your body like that and address all these nagging chronic pain that you've probably been dealing with for many years. And how many times do you guys have this too, where a, a client tells you that you know it's because they're getting old. I mean, I was literally on. Oh, the, I'm just this because I'm old. I'm yeah. on the phone, okay, with with my uncle yesterday, who by the way works for the for the company. And it, it's it's crazy how this, uh, it just, it reminds me of how much we have to keep repeating this message that <laughs> I've got somebody <laughs> who works for the company, understands everything that we're doing, yet will say things to me like he did on the phone yesterday about his hips. And he's just like, yeah, you know, my hips are just, they're shot, they're done. And they, you know, they don't, I'm getting old, you know, it's part of getting, you'll see when you get older. It's like, you know how many times I've heard that? I've been hearing oh, that yeah. since I was 20 just years old. Just call it in. I'm yeah, getting old. You'll see. Yeah. When you get older, you'll see. You get, well, and let me tell you, I know when I got older, when I got in my thirties, you're right. My hips got bursitis. I had low back pain, but it wasn't because I got old. It was because in my early 20s, when I thought I was invincible, I wasn't addressing any of my poor movement patterns. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going joint by joint and looking at if I had any dysfunction, if I had limited range of motion, and I wasn't addressing it. Therefore, I started to get these aches and pains in my 30s. But luckily, I'm wise enough to know that it isn't because I'm 30 or 35 or 40 that I feel that. It's because I didn't address something in my 20s because I didn't feel it then, and now I feel it. And it's not because you're old. Yeah. It's it's because you're not addressing something that you want to address first before you even think about. And you may think of those those examples right now personally of of certain types of movements and things that uh, may stick out right away. Like, oh my god, oh, wait a minute, no, that's gonna I'm gonna feel that in my wrist. Oh no, I'm gonna feel that in my shoulder. So you start just just naturally avoiding certain types of movements, and then what that does over time is it your body just deprioritizes those types of movements, and now. I can't do those movements. No, that's a great point. So it's not so much that you're going to identify areas of your body that hurt so you can avoid certain exercises, although that's a part of it at first. The idea is to identify those areas of pain and get them to not hurt anymore so that you can do lots of exercises. So, you know, again, you know, talking about the back, like, oh, my back gets a little tight when I sit for a long time. Okay, so initially we're going to avoid certain exercises, but we're going to address why that happens in the first place. Let's create better movement patterns so that your back doesn't bother you anymore so that you can do all these other exercises. Most pain that people have comes from poor movement patterns. Uh, a small percentage of people's pain actually comes from acute injury. So mm -hmm. unless if your knee hurts because you literally smashed it yesterday or hurt your knee, that's different. But if your knee hurts and it's just been hurting and sometimes it bothers me when I do certain things, well, that's chronic pain, and that's usually the result of poor movement patterns. So imagine imagine this for a second. You've got poor movement patterns that kind of cause knee pain every once in a while when you do certain things. What do you think is going to happen to your knee if you just go into a workout without addressing that? It's going to get much worse. And then, and then what ends up happening? You have to stop mm -hmm. your workout. You can't do what you were doing before because you've exacerbated a problem because you never corrected it in the first place. And that's where most of the value comes from an assessment is identifying these parts of your body, getting yourself ready. By the way, while you're doing this, it's still, you're still working out. You're still moving. Your body's still adapting. You're probably still building a little bit of muscle, but you're preparing and prepping your body so that as you start to move forward, things accelerate mm -hmm. and you get really, really good results. Well, we should simplify too. Why, why is it that we get chronic pain as we get older? Like, why, why is it that we all, you know, when I used to sit down as a kid at school all day long, my low back didn't bother me. But now when I sit down in a car or Time. a plane, right, what, what, what is it though? It's what we need to understand or what people need to understand that are listening uh, and trying to figure out, you know, why is it that my knee all of a sudden hurts all the time? Or why do my hips bother me all the time? Is the, the entire body is supposed to work and communicate together. And when we're when we're young and spry and 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 playing and moving in all different planes all the time, we do a really good job of staying very well connected and utilizing the joints through its full range of motion. And as as time goes on, like Justin was alluding to earlier, if you if you don't use it, you lose it. And so when you you stop utilizing a joint and moving it through its full range of motion, it says, okay, we don't need to do that anymore. But then you still got to go through your normal daily activity. So what ends up happening? is the body starts to figure out how to overcompensate to keep you still doing the things that you have to do, but because you're not training the body and strengthening it to work and speak together, 
it starts to overcompensate in certain areas. That overcompensation is what we call like overactive muscles or tight muscles. And that tightness or overactiveness ends up pulling and stressing the joints and ligaments. And that's where the chronic pain comes from. Well, the, so, you know, when you look at joints and how they move, um, there's an ideal way that they can move. And then there's a, a less than ideal way that they can move. And you mm -hmm. can get away with less than ideal for a while, mm -hmm. but over time it starts to overcome your body's ability to heal from the poor movement and you start to cause problems. This is why, you know, if you start moving, you know, poorly now and you're in your twenties, it might take five or six years of just basic walking and moving, but eventually you'll start to develop problems. By the way, usually it happens a little sooner than that, but over time you start to cause problems. So if you think of like a, like a sliding glass door, it fits on a track, right? And it slides on the track. If it's off the track just a little bit, it'll still open and close, but over mm -hmm. time, it starts to chew up that track, starts to uh -huh. cause problems. And then what are you going to do? You replace the door without ever fixing the fact that it doesn't track properly. You're going to cause uh, that track to get chewed up again. Mm -hmm. So this is what happens to the body. The body does this over time. So if you don't correct problems and set yourself up well before you get into your workouts and you just get into your workouts the odds that you're going to have to modify, 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 and then eventually eliminate exercises, the odds that you may even have to stop working out are significantly higher. Even if you don't ever have to do all that, we know that good movement produces better results than poor movement, even mm -hmm. if there's no pain. Mm -hmm. So a good squat, even if there's, you know, a, a great squat is going to give you better leg gains, better strength gains, uh, better muscle development, your quads, hamstrings, and glutes, than a bad squat, even if both of them don't produce better any pain. movement, you're going to be able to recruit more muscle fibers. I mean, and that's talk about maximizing your time and efficiency. That's what we all want out of these workouts. We want to do things uh, as specific as possible in order to get a result that we want and not just waste our time. Nobody wants to be in there wasting their time and adding more problems to what you already had pre-existing. So this is such an important thing to consider uh, when coming back in and then wanting to then change your body the correct way. Well, not only do I think that this is one of the most valuable things that a trainer can provide for you, this was also one of my favorite things uh, that brought the three of us together. Um uh, to, to this day, I think all of us equally, for sure I am, uh, most proud of the MAPS Prime program because of this, because we we all value this part, the assessment portion uh, of training uh, more than anything else that we've ever created or we've ever talked about on the podcast. And the the idea of, okay, how do we take our years of experience and what I can uh, I can give to somebody in person. When I have a person for hours on hours, day after day, and see the way they move, and then address, then change my programming based off of that and address that to help help that person. How do I take that knowledge and then put it in a digital form to help the masses? And then how did the three of us all collaborate on that? And that really was the birth of. Maps Prime, which is truly an assessment. It's an mm -hmm. assessment that everybody should go through before they get into any sort of a routine. And the way that we simplified it for the masses, not just for trainers and coaches to utilize, but for the average Jane or Joe to be able to utilize and help themselves out, was we we agreed what we thought were three of the most important movements that we would need to see to re really be able to start to point that person in the right direction. Right. And in, in, in basic, and this is very basic, if you can do these movements uh, perfectly without lots of struggle, without pain, you can, you know, complete them well, um, then you're good. If you can't, then we'll give you a list of exercises that you can practice so that you can do those tests. And generally speaking, of course, it gets much more, uh, you know, individualized as you, when you work on an individual basis. But generally speaking, if you could do the following three things really well, um, then you're probably, for the most part, going to be okay uh, when you do, you know, when you go into your workouts. The, the first test that we did that we put in there is called the wall test. By the way, um, if you want really detailed explanation of how to do some of the stuff we're going to talk about, you can go on our YouTube channel, search for these things, or if you go on uh, our Mind Pump Media uh, uh, website, 
in the show notes for the podcast. So click there on should the all be links in the show notes <laughs> after this. Yeah, you'll be able to click on it and actually watch us kind of break down how to do it. But we'll explain it right now um, on the podcast. Uh, a wall test really is looking at uh, mostly the upper body. Okay, we're looking at the upper body, although there's a little bit of the lumbar spine in there, but you know the lower back. But we're looking at the upper body and we're looking at your ability to move through, move your shoulders through a full range of motion. And if you're able to hold yourself um, and stabilize yourself in, in in really good posture. Yeah, this is mostly cervical spine, thoracic spine, so mid back, neck, and shoulders, and mm -hmm. and 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 your ability to to move properly in those areas. So basically, the upper from the chest above are all the the areas that we're looking at. And and the reason why the wall slide. Uh, oh, the wall test. The wall test, wall slide, mm. uh, was chosen by the three of us was because it really points out the most common offenders. Like when we look at uh, all the clients that we've trained, uh, I would say at least 80% of those people suffer from some level of upper cross syndrome. Mm. This is desk jobs. This is this is like uh, just something you see every day in the workforce. You see uh, in schools. It's just we we have sort of set everything up so we're always sort of hunched forward and we're riding in front of us and we're looking in front of us and we're leaning forward constantly. And so just the, the patterns of that alone creates these types of compensations that we're trying to address with this specific test. Yeah, your body literally molds itself um, yeah. to what you do all day long. You guys ever look at pictures? Ever see those like old pictures of uh, from Japan when they used to do foot binding, and mm. then they would take the foot binding off to oh, see what the foot looked horrific. like? Have you ever seen that? Yes. Yeah. So these yeah, was, was it was it from China. was it China or Japan? China. China. Okay, so uh, China. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they showed these yeah. these uh, they, if you can look these up online, uh, but if you're a little queasy, I, I would suggest you don't. But they would bind the you know these girls' feet when they were really young to keep them really small. And then there's pictures of what the foot would look like when they take the binding off. And the whole foot was folded underneath with the toes underneath because the body starts to shape itself through these outside forces. And so, you know, if you sit down a lot, well, first off, you're normal. If you live in modern society, you probably sit down a lot. You probably have a desk job. You, you're on your phone or computer. And so your body kind of molds itself that way. So what ends up happening is your, your, your head starts to jut forward. You get what's called forward head. So you lose that tall neck posture. Your shoulders start to round. Okay. This is where the shoulders kind of come forward. That's a part of your body molding itself to the, you know, to the way you're, 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 you're working and sitting all the time. Now that can cause problems when you go to work out. When I do, when I go to do certain exercises, the risk of shoulder pain or neck tightness, yeah. you know, if you think you have a tight neck now, uh, you know, it's going to get way worse if you don't correct this problem when you go do your workout. If it's well, forward and you're straining, oh man, the, the pain will be almost immediate. Well, let's just talk about the the big five, right? The big five movements that we always talk about that are so important. And when you look at like uh, overhead press and bench press, which are staples in almost every muscle building fat loss program. And if you have excessive forward shoulder and forward head, you're looking for a potential injury that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. so at, it's a big problem. Or at the bare minimum, aches and pains that are going to come from that if you don't address this. Right, right. And, and you know, by the way, neck tension and tightness is a nice, easy signal to know that this may be a problem. And the reason why you get that tightness is there's muscles in the in the neck area that start to, to compensate to try to stabilize this poor posture. So if you get tension in your neck, you're like, ah, oh, why do I get so tight? You know, you don't even work out. You just sit down in front of a desk and yet you get this tightness. You probably have uh, some of these, what are called posture deviations. Okay, so let's talk about the wall test and how to perform this. Again, we have the video linked uh, in the show notes, but we'll try to explain it on the podcast uh, the best that we can. So a wall, you want to use a wall because that's feedback. You want mm -hmm. a nice straight wall right. that you could lean up against. You want to place your body up against, stand up against the wall, you want your butt to touch the wall. You want your shoulders to touch the wall. You want your back to be relatively flat. You don't have a huge arch in your low back. You should be able to probably press against your hand if you were to slide it under your low back. So you don't want to have this super strong, you know, butt sticking out type of arch. And then here's the important part to start with. You want the back of your head. There's a, a, a small, at the base of your skull, you'll feel, if you feel it around right now under oh, your hair, nodule. there's a small nodule that you'll feel. I can't remember the name of it, um, but we all have it. 
that's the part you want to be touching the wall while your butt and upper back and shoulders are touching the wall. So. In order to produce that, you do have to look pretty silly. I mean, you have to like pull your chin in, so you're basically performing the double chin. I do yeah. this every time I smile. Yeah, fat face. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're going to have fat. Ah. If you're doing this right, you'll have fat face, right? That's and it. Most people are going to have... So everybody, and this is what's... the Why this is so important is that... Uh, Almost everybody has this. Yeah, but yeah, don't feel bad, by the way. Yeah, most people this, will fail this. You're going to yeah. fail it. Cause I haven't even given you the test part yet. That's just, I know. just the beginning <laughs> yeah, of the yeah, position, yeah. <laughs> which uh, I would say probably a good 30% of you can't even do that. I right. bet you about 30% listening right now can't even get the nodule of their head up against the wall without overarching their back or taking their another butt off common the one too just to get the shoulders to touch a lot of times you really have to excessively arch the lower back yep. and so a lot of times uh and this is why we do try to then press our lower back into the wall by drawing in you know your stomach and and squeezing your core so you actually lose that connectivity in your core which is vital especially if you're pressing anything overhead we want to make sure that we're our spine is supported so uh if you start to arch excessively you have this rib flare which your ribs start to kind of come up and it's it's very visible uh that's something that we need to correct yeah if you start to feel shearing in your low back like oh i'm arching too hard then okay you're you're, you're failing the movement the, the, you're not able to produce this movement or even what justin says like our test in prime we actually take a stick you have and, to hold it in position and you actually hold the stick there so you have to maintain core stability and the pressing of the low back while also tucking the chin. And right. you're right, probably 30% of the people listening right now can't even do that. Can't even keep their back flat and tuck their chin. And here's the deal. One, like Sal said, don't beat yourself up. You can't do it. A lot of people won't be able to do this, but that's your that right there is a flag that you want to address this. And we'll mm -hmm. give you exercises that'll be good that you should focus on if you can't do this test. Well, that's one right there in itself. Chin yes. tucks. Oh, just just the chin tuck. Just, if you're somebody right now who that is challenging. Like you we can't even we haven't even got to the wall test part that Sal's going to keep going on and it's already hard for you to flatten the back and tuck your chin against the wall. That's an exercise. Just practice that. That's an exercise. Mm -hmm. I would I would take and clients that I had that were in this case, I would have them press their back flat against the wall and then we would tuck their chin and they would press hard with their chin tucked for five seconds, hold, breathe, then release, do it again for five seconds, hold, release. And I do that for about five to ten times. I practice and you can regress this a little bit by kind of taking a towel or, or a little yoga block or something then to kind of smash into the wall and then slowly kind of reduce the size of what that object is until now I, I, I have the ability to bring my head all the way By back. the way, this gets so bad in middle-aged uh, individuals that when I would train a client who was in their late 30s up to mid 40s or or older and i'd have them lay flat on the floor their head getting touched the ground there i would have to put uh, towels under their head because otherwise they would it's like they were looking behind them because mm -hmm. they'd lay flat and then their head was so far off the floor that in order for them to put their head back they'd have to look uh, way back and it was super uncomfortable so i mean if, if that's you you've got really bad forward head but it can get corrected you can have and what you have to understand why this is so important is that if you if you can't do simple movements like this you're still going about your day your body is then overcompensating to do things so then like you know you saw made the comment of you looking so if you go to turn to look to the right or turn to look to the left your body now has to kind of tweak itself to do that to still be able to get that you have to rotate your shoulders with you right because you've now lost that mobility in your cervical spine to be able to do that that's why this is so important and even if it's not causing tension headaches right now or causing neck pain or shoulder pain now it eventually will and it won't be because you're old it's because you didn't address yeah, this. Well, you know, what's funny is uh, a lot of people don't even realize how bad they feel until they correct it. Right. Yeah. You know, and they're like, oh my, I didn't realize just how oh, it's liberating. heavy my head felt yeah. until I was able to fix, you know, this posture. Okay. So back to the wall test. So you're up against the wall, the nodule of your, of your, your, your skull up against the wall, shoulders up against the wall, your butt is up against the wall. You're not overarching. So that's nice and tight. You're, you're not flaring your ribs. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take your arms and you're going to bend your elbows and place them up against the wall like you're putting your hands up, okay? Like a, like, like a police officer tells you to put your hands up. But your elbows are bent, okay, at about 90 degrees. Now, you want your whole arm touching the wall. Mm -hmm. You want your elbows to touch the wall, and you want the full back of your wrist and hand to touch the wall. Now, a lot of you here aren't even going to be able to do that. 
you're going to get in this position and you're going to have to like bend your wrist back right. just to touch the Fingers wall. Fingers can touch, but yeah, your wrists are nowhere near the no, wall. No, you want everything flat and, up against the wall while holding the original position that we talked about before. And very common in this. So this is really common. This is a challenge for me. Uh, and what you'll see a lot of times is one side worse than the other. Yeah. So sometimes somebody will be able to get their hand flat against the wall on one side, but not the other side. So that tells us that they they are their their shoulders are more rounded on the other side. This is common with somebody like like my teachers. A lot of times, if you're a teacher and you write on a whiteboard all the time, or you're in construction and you're using your right arm for, or like a hairstylist, you're using one side more and it's constantly protracted and and in forward forward in front of you. Again, like Sal was saying earlier, you start to shape the body that way. So then when I ask you to be able to retract the shoulders and pull back in that position, that side that is used to being so forward all the time struggles even more to get back there, which again is going to start to cause all kinds of other issues when you go to do a movement like a shoulder press or a bench press. Now when you do that, you got to understand that one side's going to be firing different than the other side because you have this imbalance because of whatever it is that you do all day long. Right. So we so now we're in that position, right? Arms up against the wall, elbows bent. Your the back of your hand is flat up against the wall. Wrist is flat up against the wall. The nodule is still in contact with the wall. Your your butt is still in contact with the wall. You're not overarching. You're keeping everything tight. Now what you're going to do while maintaining all those points of contact is you're going to slide your hands all the way up like you're going to extend your arms up above your head, everything's staying in contact, and then bring them back down. Now, if you're like most people, um, you're going to lose some points of contact. Right. Nine, like, your 90% elbows are going to come off, will. like all kinds of things yeah, are going to happen. If you're like most people, you're, you're not going to be able to do this uh, perfectly. Something's going to come off the wall. Or in order to keep everything in contact with the wall, you're like straining and struggling like crazy. Okay, Those are both considered... Fail just means that you need to work on a few things. So we're going to give you some of our favorite exercises that help fix a lot of these issues. Now, one of my favorite exercises, very basic, is a row. Uh, a seated row is better for correctional purposes than other types of rows, like a bent over barbell row. It's just harder to get somebody to pull their shoulders back and have good posture when doing a bent over barbell row versus a seated row. I love bands for this correctional exercise. Rather than using a cable or using a weight, grab a resistance band, attach it around a secure object, maybe put it in your door jam or whatever, or even put it around your feet. You could even do it just around your feet. Sit up nice and tall, brace your core, create that posture that you did with the wall test where your head was tall. You don't have to have your back up against the wall, but create that posture. Then do the row, pulling your shoulders back and down, hold that position, squeeze, let it come forward. I'm so glad that you said that because the idea of all these tests too and the and the wall test is the wall is just there for feedback so you can understand where you're supposed to get. Like if once you've practiced and I always would tell clients mm -hmm. that like this this is yes an exercise and a test that I'm doing with you but I also want you to to pay attention to how your body feels when you're tucking your chin, you're pulling your shoulder blades back, and to think about that now when we get out on the weight room floor. Now when I take you into exercises and I say get into that posture, you know, tuck your chin or sit your chest up high or pull your shoulder blades back, you're trying to remember what it felt like when you were pressing against the wall. You want to think about that. Like it's not just and this is why exercises performed correctly are far more valuable than just flat out exercising it's how you do the movement oh it's like it's it's two different universes yeah doing exercises wrong is just training your body to move wrong that's what you do just practicing teaching your body this is the wrong way to move. We're going to keep getting this stronger and stronger. So you actually create and, strength in the bad uh, movement pattern. And I know we have a very wide a variety of listeners out there that, uh, you know, some people might not even be able to get anywhere close uh, to doing these things on the wall. And so uh, an option that you can use is to do this on the, on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so to lay down flat on your back and go through these same type of movements and do, do a slide using your arms in, in the position Sal was describing with your elbows bent and your your, your wrist touching the ground and then reach behind you and just start start with that, really start to connect to that and try and squeeze uh, and fuel your muscles through that process. And yes. the reason why that's a regression or a good place to start if you really struggle with the wall is we're just using gravity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We're now using gravity to help us, right? Gravity's pushing down on us, so all those things that are deviated, it's pushing against them yep. to assist you 
where when you're standing upright, you have to actively be able to intrinsically think about all those things to get in that, which can be a little bit challenging if you've never done it before. So that's a great, that's a great that's right. tip. Here's another good one I think I can explain uh, through the podcast. Uh, these are called wall circles. They're really, really good for shoulder mobility. And uh, essentially, here's what you do. You stand up against with your shoulder up against the wall. So now you're kind of <coughs> standing sideways to the wall. So place your shoulder up against the wall. Take your hand, the back of your hand, place it up against the wall. Now rotate your hand or keep your arm straight. Create like a like you're creating a big circle with your arm. With yeah. the back of your hand up on the wall until you can't go any further. Then turn your hand so that your palm is on the wall and go all the way around and make a complete circle it's harder. It's harder done than said. It's a lot easier said than done. Well, you want to raise your arm nice and slow all the way up till you get to about your ear or so, right? And then you have to and, turn and, the hand. Try not to lean away from the wall either, which is going to be something you're going to want to naturally do. So you try and you know really concentrate on staying in one place and, and, and really connecting to that. And then right when uh, you, you get past your ear, about so start rotating your wrist, and then you're going to get your palm down and then kind of continue the circle like Celsius. So yes. So my my favorite, and we're addressing similar things by doing this, but my favorite move to teach uh, for shoulder mobility like this, and where you're taking it through its full range of motion, like the uh, wall circles, is handcuff with rotation. We have a great video yep. on YouTube. That'll be in the show notes. Yeah, on handcuff with rotation, same concept. That's what we're trying to do is work on taking the shoulder through its fullest range of motion in all the planes. Uh, handcuff with rotation does that. Uh, I find it a little bit easier to teach than the wall circles. Most people that I would teach wall circles with, I feel like they, they have a hard time. Unless you're advanced, you have a hard time understanding the concept of what you need, how you need to keep your body and not deviate. Because yeah, they move away from Right, the wall. yeah. Anybody can stand by a wall and do draw circles on the wall. <laughs> but what, what you find with the clients is they, they, they lean away from the wall and then they, they cheat. They, roll, they rotate their, their upper body to right. turn. And the idea is that you are staying in a very fixed position and we're working on just the shoulder joint where it's a little, I think, harder to coach to. I think handcuff with rotation is easier for me to coach to and accomplish Publishes the same concept. That's another yeah, great watch. Move. Watch Absolutely. the video. We really break it down. Uh, prone Cobra, another great exercise. Great, we have that on, great, great movement on YouTube as well. Really, really good at, at strengthening the mid back, drawing the shoulders down. You could do it on the floor. You could do it on a physio ball. You could do it on a bench. Mm -hmm. Great, great exercise. All right, let's move to the next uh, test that we you know that we think is really good. This is a. It's called a windmill. Um, a little bit more difficult to explain on the podcast. Uh, but essentially, you're standing with your feet uh, maybe shoulder width or slightly wider than shoulder width apart. Mm -hmm. And you want one foot slightly forward. So let's pick your left, for example. Left foot a little bit further forward than your right foot. And now what you want to do essentially is you want to reach down with your right arm totally straight. So you're touching the floor. And then reach up with your right arm straight up into the sky. So left arm is touching the floor. Right arm is pointed up at the sky, and you want to create a perfect line. So, yes, you are not only bent over, but you're also twisted so that your arms create a perfect line while keeping your feet planted way harder than it sounds. Right. So, as you have the staggered stance, so one way to, I like to look at it is I have my toes and my right foot. If my left foot's slightly forward, my toes line up with my left ankle. Mm. And so now I'm in a staggered stance. I'm upright. Uh, I'm going to raise my arm up to my ear and my palm is going to be facing, you know, inside towards my ear. And then I'm going to look up at my hand. And so once I look up at my hand, now I'm going to start to slide my hips back and rotate my hand. And that's going to create that rotation in my back that we're looking for. And meanwhile, my other arm, my left arm is going to be straight the whole time. And it's not going to come forward past my leg. It's going to stay right alongside my my leg. And I'm just going to naturally kind of slide it down as my hips produce depth. So my hips slide back, which which creates the opportunity for my hand to then get further down. Yeah. Now, what is this looking for? Yeah, right? I was going to say, what's more, what's more important to me than I think describing the the movement, because Justin's got a great video on that. We have videos on all the things that we're talking about. Right. Is why we do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I love the windmill because what we're looking for is the ability for you to hinge at the hips, okay, like you would need to do if you were to squat down or anything. Like or deadlift. Of, right, or deadlift or pick anything up or sit on a toilet. Think this is, These are functional movements, right? The ability to hinge. And then also 
have rotational control of the spine. Mm -hmm. Because, w uh, yeah, when you do a squat, you're, you're in a fixed position, or when you deadlift, you're in a fixed position. But in real life... You know, and you pick up a bag of you dog. Need to rotate, right? You pick up a bag of dog food or something that's an odd object, and you you bend over, you hinge over, and you grab it. The ability to control your spine rot rotationally or anti rotationally in that position is extremely important for longevity and health. And that's why this movement. This was a uh, this is Justin's baby that he yeah. added to this. That I remember when I remember I'll never forget when when he said that I think this is important needs to be in here. And Sal and I are both like, oh, 100%. I don't know why I didn't even think of that right away, why this should be in here, because that is a this is another very common area that people break down and can't do. And this is where, man, you want to talk about low back pain uh, and issues in, in anywhere up and down your back. A lot of times it's caused because people just don't have the ability to rotate at the spine mm -hmm. because they lose that because we just don't we don't train that anymore or we don't use it very much as we get older. And then when we finally do, we're weak in that area and then we get hurt doing, and it's always something. Like, how many times you guys heard this? Like I never had clients get hurt because they were deadlifting 200 pounds. They were always hurt picking up the shampoo bottle or they were hurt gardening, you know, pulling, you know, reaching back in the car. Cause the yeah, kid, reaching yeah, back yeah. for the kids in the car. It's always this weird, it's not heavy. It's just it. They're, they're doing something either quick and fast and they think that their body is capable of doing it and they haven't trained in that range of motion. It becomes anymore. unfamiliar because yes. it's just not a part of your daily habits anymore. And so this is why it's so important to then teach the body again. Like this is something that we need to be able to do and to be able to do it correctly uh, requires this type of training. So now I have to like literally teach my body. I need to be able to rotate like this. I need to be able to look up with my head and my neck needs to rotate this way. My upper back needs to be able to rotate as well while keeping my hips going a specific direction. And all these things have to happen without any pain. Yeah, uh, and, and again, the areas you're looking at with this are in the middle, lower part of the body, but you are getting a little bit of shoulder. You are looking at a little bit of shoulder mobility. So let's say you try it. By the way, all these tests that we're giving you themselves can be practiced over and over again as well. So yeah, they're, they're, those are exercises by themselves. Yeah, so if you can't do the, the wall test, if you can't do the windmill test well, um, one of the easiest ways to correct issues that uh, are resulting of your because of your inability to do it is just to practice. Mm -hmm. practice these movements but besides the windmill here's some good exercises and movements that will help you uh, work on the areas uh, or work on the why you can't maybe do it one of my favorites is uh is the lizard with rotation one of the best i love lizard with rotation we have a great video on this as well but it does work on that lumbar ability to rotate it does work a little bit on the hip hinging Really easy to do. What I love about it also requires no equipment. You just do it at home. You could do it on your own. In fact, it's a staple for me as part of my priming or warming up. Anytime I warm up for a workout or whatever, Lizard's always in there. Now, Lizard with Rotation, I think, is a, a common movement uh, that trainers use. But I also see it done incorrectly a lot. Now, like we made the point in the, the last part of the assessment of remembering the, the windmill test and when you were hinging and rotating to try and get your hand to the floor and reach up, where it felt limiting for you, you're trying to challenge that when you're doing a movement like the lizard with rotation. So what I mean by when I see a lot of people do this incorrectly is they get into this lizard with rotation exercise, which you get down almost like in a plank position or a runner's position, and you're pulling your shoulder through, and then you're rotating your spine and looking up. And you see people just kind of like whip through this, and that's like their warm-up. No, you got to go reach through. Yeah. The idea is that you do it slow and controlled, and then when you get to the end ranges of motion – you, you kind of pause there and you challenge it, yeah. right? You intensify. You give it some isometric squeeze. Yes, you intensify it by getting the isometric squeeze and challenging the range of motion. Not through dynamic whipping. It's not supposed to be fast <laughs> and going back and forth. It's a new class. Right? Yeah. <laughs> dynamic whipping. I mean, <laughs> how often, though, do you see that, Whip right? When I see, when I see a lizard with rotation done in the gym, I yeah. see people just, they saw a video probably of it, and they're just mimicking it. When you do it, the intent of how you do it is the most important part. Otherwise, 
you're not really working on where the dysfunction and the breakdown is. The dysfunction and the breakdown normally with a windmill is the inability for you to rotate the thoracic and lumbar spine and rotate around like that. So then when I'm doing the lizard with rotation, I'm challenging the end ranges of motion and intensifying like Justin said, and then coming back through and then challenging it again each time. So another thing I've I had like issues with being able to access like my thoracic spine and be able to flex, extend and do these things and manipulate it a certain way. And so cat cow was, it was a drill that I would do constantly to really try to, I love cat cow. yeah, to, to, to gain a uh, control of that again. And I think that a lot of people don't realize like, and, and that's again, Again, it's just addresses a lot of other issues as well, whether like you have uh, if your shoulders are too protruded forward, uh, you know, that this is all going to be compensations that we're addressing to that affect uh, your upper back and in, in your thoracic area that uh, now you don't have access and, and movement that you should. Yeah. Cat, one of the reasons why I like cat cow so much is almost anybody can do it. It's yeah. like one of the easiest you know, ways you can work on some of this mobility with, like I could do this with, uh, you know, old people who have bad mobility. I'd have them on their hands and knees on a, on, on right. a soft surface and have them practice rounding their back and then have them practice letting it sink in an arch and they would just go back and forth. Um, it's something most people can do. Well, and it's really all we're doing is we're, we're, we're trying to regain control of your spine. Mm -hmm. and, and and each and when you're doing something like cat cow, you're like actually doing it at each vertebrae, right? You're trying to articulate that in and out or up and down in this case, right. which is why too I like things like bird dog, right? Bird dog is another one of those yes. movements similar to cat cow. Seems really basic when you see somebody it's doing it. All about it. the intent, though, right? It, that and that and that's I think the, the the takeaway from this conversation today is like. I, and and <clears throat> I, I'm guilty of this as a trainer. I, I remember as a trainer when I first learned all this stuff. Like, I think I, I had a surface level understanding of, oh, these are important movements I should have clients do, and I teach them and just kind of let them do it. Mm -hmm. And they're 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 so simple that if you don't move slowly and work on the intent of it and make them challenging, you're not really doing much work, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? Yep. If you just get under and you do cat cow or bird dog and you're just kind of whipping through it or lizard with rotation and you're just kind of whipping through the movement. you get like 10% of, of the benefits. Right. You'll get a very, <laughs> very minimal amount of benefits. Sure, it'll, it'll help you stay at least that mobile to where you can continue to do that. So it's not bad that you're doing that. But the the max benefits are going to come from like really paying attention to the detail of the movement and really trying to articulate the spine and stay in control and challenge the end ranges of motion. Not let things rotate, be able to really like keep bracing and, and holding things in place that need to stay in place. So all those things matter. And so if you slow down and focus in on all those little cues and things that your body just naturally kind of falls into, you stop that momentum of just letting your body yeah. control you. That's it. Two more exercises you could look up on our channel, Thread the Needle and supine scorpions, I believe they're both on there. I know thread the needle is for sure. Yeah, um, those are both. Those are also those movements are great. that you can work on if doing a windmill you find uh, difficult or you just can't do it uh, perfectly. Um, the last one. This is a staple in any assessment I've ever almost almost any assessment I've ever seen because when you look at you know assessments that trainers and coaches do, there tends to be some variety and different versions, and you know they can do that because they're watching the client in person. But one always pops up because this tells you a lot about your 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 body's mobility, and that's a squat. Mm -hmm. This is a squat test. Now, you there's a couple ways you can do this. The real basic way to do it is just to try to go down in a squat and look for different thing, a few different things. But if you really want to have a little bit more detail, here's what I recommend: um, get a broomstick, place it on your low back with, by holding it with your arm. And you want it to be touching your tailbone, you want it to be touching the mid-back, and you want it to be touching the back of your head, and hopefully it's the nodule in the back of your skull. The video that I have on my Instagram right now, which will be the last video, like I won't post anything between now and this video being live, is that. Okay, perfect. I don't know if you've seen that or not. It's perfect. actually a picture of me holding the stick on those three points of contact on my Instagram page. So Perfect. if you want to see nice. what you're talking about. Good. And now when you're holding that stick there, now you want to get your feet a little wider than shoulder width and you want to do a full squat. Go down as low as you can comfortably and look for a few different things. Did those points of contact come off the stick? Did your heels come off the floor? 
Did your knees cave in? These are all real common issues that people tend to Did see. Did you shift to one side or the yeah, other? Yeah, are you leaning to one side okay. or the other? Um, these are things that people tend to see or issues that they tend to see when they do uh, a squat test. Um, and if you see any of these issues, then you definitely want to work on fixing those problems. Now, one of the most common issues that you see with this is someone can't squat without their heels mm -hmm. coming off the floor or their feet will turn out really, really far and their ankles will cave in. It's kind of a similar problem. It's because you have really, really tight uh, calves. You have poor ankle mobility. Um, well, one of my favorite movements to address this is called the combat stretch. Again, we have a video of that on our YouTube channel and it's just exceptional at fixing uh, ankle mobility issues. Uh, what about when your knees cave in? Uh, my knees like to cave in all the time. Well, one of the best ways to fix that, if you don't uh, want to use any equipment or anything, is to squat slowly while pushing your knees out. If mm -hmm. you need some feedback, you can tie something around your legs, like a, a rubber band or something like that. <clears throat> Push your knees out as you do your slow squats. That helps with that uh, as well. Um, and then floor bridges. I love floor bridges for strengthening the hips. Some people, when they squat, one of the reasons why their heels come off the floor is they're not able to sit back properly. They can't activate the glutes. Mm -hmm. Floor bridges uh, really helps to activate that. Anything I'm missing? Well, yeah. When you when you when you talk also too about the knees collapsing, the rubber band is one thing. This is also where um, a lot of times when the knees collapse like that is just your inability to internally and externally rotate the hips really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this and this is very very common. This is also connected to a lot of times when people have bursitis in their hips like I did, right? So because I lack the ability to internally, externally rotate the hip uh, to its fullest capacity, and then I still were, I still was squatting, all of a sudden I get this like sharp, like feels like pain, like someone's sticking a knife in my hip. Uh, those are, that's the, bur the bursitis sacs that I'm feeling that hurts like that. And the reason why I'm getting that is because I'm still performing exercises, but I'm not addressing my inability to rotate my hips like I should. And a lot of times you see that expressed in the knees collapsing too. So one of the best things that you can do and uh, for sure been game changer, life changer for myself has been the 90-90 variations. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing, and we have lots of good videos on uh, the 90-90 and the variations around them. And when you, when you get good at being able to internally, externally rotate the hips, uh, it just, it, it opens up that whole hip complex, allows you to get down into the deep squat without overcompensating and will leave. A lot of times, this is also what's connected to low back pain. A lot of times people think low back pain is like, oh, I have my low back hurts, so something's wrong in the low back area specifically. A lot of times it's related to the whole hip complex because it's all connected. And because the hip complex is so tight, it's pulling on the low back area. And that tightness is coming from the inability to rotate the hips right, very well. Right. So, and also being able to stabilize your spine properly throughout this entire process, too. In the 90-90s, it, it will expose that almost immediately just sitting in that position because now it's just about your torso standing as upright as possible and as vertical as possible while your hips are in that position, internal and external uh, rotational position. And so uh, to, to be able to then brace properly and, and then keep your, your, your upper body from falling to one side or the other, uh, you're going to be able to really expose expose that and work on that. Right, right. So remember, you when you do a good assessment of yourself, you ask yourself the right questions, you do some of these movements, and you can identify some of the problems. Now your workout becomes correcting those issues. That's how you start your workout. You work. And by the way, it's a workout. You're still strengthening your body. You're still building a little bit of muscle. You're still burning some calories. And then once you go through the process of, of doing this and you find that over time, wow, I can do the wall test now and I feel relatively comfortable. Wow, I could do the windmill test, and I'm starting to feel comfortable. Wow, I can do a squat. Now you can start to progress your body into heavier and harder movements. But for, for the time being, a lot of your exercise should be focused on correcting a lot of these issues. Now, if you want something more specific, if you want more coaching, because I know this can be a little bit complex, although we have a lot of free videos on YouTube, and I think if you practice these tests, even just practice these tests on their own, you'll benefit greatly. Um, you could try one of our programs, MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro. A lot of people ask, the, what's the difference between the two? MAPS Prime has, the, has the, the general assessments that we talked about, and it really teaches you how to get your body primed and warmed up for your workout. So what does that mean? That means, if, let's say you fail the windmill test. Let's say the windmill test is the most difficult thing for you. Well, MAPS Prime will show you what you need to do 
because that's what you failed before you get into your regular workout. So let's say you're following a MAPS anywhere, then you would do the specific MAPS prime movements for you to get your body ready for your MAPS anywhere workout. So that's just an example. And really, it can be any workout uh, that you do. Now, MAPS prime pro, it breaks down every single joint. It's much more specific, mm -hmm. much more correctional. You can look at the ankles. You can look at the hips. You can look at your your wrists. wrists you can yeah. look at your spine from the lumbar all the way more, up to your more neck, neck all specific, that stuff. Yeah. All very, very correctional. And here's the cool thing about correctional exercise: requires almost or no equipment. In fact, a lot of the most of the best correctional exercise movements involve no equipment uh, whatsoever. And here's the other key: correctional exercises are best done very frequently. You're better off practicing them throughout the day. So rather than doing like two one-hour correctional exercise workouts a week, um, every other hour spend five minutes picking one movement and practicing it. That will give you better, faster results because what you're trying to do with correctional exercise is create new recruitment bat patterns and to correct uh, the old bad recruitment patterns. Um, now, uh, here's the best part. Both MAPS Prime and Prime Pro are 50% off, so we put them both half off. So if you're interested, now's a great time to enroll. You can go to mapsfitnessproducts.com, so M-A-P-S fitnessproducts.com. Use the code PRIME50 for the 50% off discount, both programs. PRIME50 is P R I M E. Five zero, the number five zero, no space, um, and input that for the discount. 